Lecture 10, Module 1, DMAIC Control Stage. Standardized solutions. In this module, we'll look at control plans, statistical process control charts, the quincunks, KPIs and KPI trees, and standardized processes using 5S and visual management. A control plan is a process management document that summarizes the measurement activities used to monitor and control every step in the process to reduce product and process variation. The control plan can be seen as a summarization of all the outputs from the Six Sigma tools used on the project. Things such as the voice of the customer, things from the value stream map, gauge r and studies, sampling plans, the process capability studies you may have performed, statistical process control studies that you may have performed, and information from your process FMECA. The control plan is essentially based off of the process FMEA or FMECA. More directly, it's a version of the FMECA excised, that is removed, where we remove the failure modes information, leaving just the process steps and the recommended actions. The recommended actions are also converted into a controls and responses uh, type of format. The excised FMECA is then converted to a control plan by adding measures, specifications, process capability, and measurement information. So here we see the control plan uh, essentially based off of a process FMECA. The process steps from the FMECA is on tube filling, and we see the recommended actions from the FMECA on the right. Uh, the control strategy in, in includes a viscometer to provide feedback, a feedback control loop uh, to a proportioning pr pump to adjust to the sodium chloride addition, and also a check wear to provide feedback uh, a control loop to the filler adjusting the fill volume. We have now added measures uh, the gel product from the proportioning pump is to be checked by from viscosity of the gel, a critical uh, quality attribute, and the fill, every filled tube will be, will be checked for fill weight. Here we see the specifications uh, for these uh, critical characteristics. And here we see the capability uh, from the, uh, hopefully from the improvements we have done uh, in the improved stage. Uh, at this point we're at the uh, CP, CPK of two. We're on target and we are at Six Sigma. Well, hopefully you got there. We, we actually may be at four and a half or five. Uh, the lower it is, the more important the control plan is. And the measurements, uh, measurements that we're going to be doing, uh, the method is an inline viscometer uh, for the viscosity. Sample size is one once a minute and the record method is a direct feed to the manufacturing execution system. Same thing with the check wear. We have a sample size one. Every tube coming out of the filler is actually checked and there's a direct feed to MES system. Statistical, statistical process control charting is a technique that uses a simple time series plot and adds controls based on the processes historical data. SPC charts provide an almost real-time tracking and analysis tool for any type of process. SPC charts can be created for processes that generate continuous data or for discrete data. There are many types of SPC charts. The most common are X-bar and R charts and X-bar and S for standard deviation charts. The I and MR or the individual and moving range chart, Q and C charts, and P and NP charts, and some others. A control chart can be simply defined as a run chart of data taken from a process with five horizontal lines drawn on the chart. The center line is drawn at the process mean or the average from the process. An upper warning limit drawn at two standard deviations above the center line. An upper control limit drawn three standard deviations above the center line. And a lower warning limit drawn two standard deviations below. And a lower control limit drawn th three standard deviations below. Now, quick note. The day-to-day -day calculations of day-to-day of, of -day control charts are not exactly that simple. Because of varying sample sizes, there are adjustment factors applied to the range or standard deviation as shown below. The calculations at the right show how limits are calculated using the range, in this case, multiplied by a factor, A2, found in the table based on sample size, and adding or subtracting the product to, to or from the average. So it's not exactly just three standard deviations, two standard deviations. Now the most common uh, control chart is the X bar and R chart. This type of control chart combines a, a chart showing changes in central tendency, the mean, with a chart showing changes in dispersion, standard deviation, or the range. To show dispersion, you must have two or more uh, results per point. 
So all points are actually an average of the results, and this value is called x bar, and is shown as an x with a line over the top, as you see on the screen. Now to calculate the upper control limits and lower control limits, these x bar values are averaged, and this result is called the x bar bar, and is shown as the x with the two lines above it. The x bar bar is a very good approximation of mu, which is the actual population standard deviation. I'm sorry, sorry so it's a population average, and can be effectively used to indicate process drift. In the days before computers, or even calculators for that matter, the standard deviation was difficult to calculate easily and a challenge for many workers in manufacturing. Therefore, instead of the standard deviation, another measure of dispersion, the range, was used instead. The range is simply the highest value minus the lowest value. Very easy to calculate. To calculate upper control limits and lower control limits, these range values are averaged, and this result is called the R bar, and is shown as R with a bar over it. The R bar is still a good approximation of the standard deviation, and is very easy to calculate and, and can indicate changing variability. Now the problem faced by Walter Schuert, the inventor of the statistical process control chart, was making sense of the data he was collecting at the time, back in the 1920s. He was collecting massive amounts of data over periods of time and had trouble figuring out what was going on. Now below we see five data points to look at every hour from a process, from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Not much we can see in this data. Can you see anything going on? Now here we see the averages and ranges added to the data sheet. We can see an increase in the range around noon, up to 1.1, and it looks like a drop in the average in the afternoon from 15 down to 14.7. But is it really significant? How big, how big of a deal is that? Now let's control chart these data. And this is what a typical control chart will look like. We've added the average and range information below. And now we will add the upper control limits and lower control limits to both the average and the range data. Then we plot the averages and the ranges. Now we see an increase in dispersion that exceeds the upper control limit. So something did happen significantly. With a downward shift in the central tendency, which extended beyond the uh, lower control limit. So something serious did happen there as well. The, now the control chart developed by Walter Schuert nearly 100 years ago provides an excellent means of visualizing the behavior of data. These control charts are still being discovered by companies today and utilized to control processes, improve quality, and save money. We'll explore the, their power further in the next slides. Now to do that, we'll have to make some data up. The control chart in the following slide was created in Minitab from 90 data points. Taken from a process had the following descriptive statistics. It was actually randomly generated data uh, with an average meant to be 50 and a standard deviation of 0.5. So as we see here, the descriptive statistics say there were a total count of 90, the mean of 50.070, and a standard deviation of 0.516. Now Minitab was instructed that there were rational subgroups of three for these data. Minitab therefore considered the 90 data points to be 30 groups of three data points and averaged every three rows. Now note, a rational subgroup is an important definition can be defined as a set of observations taken from a process at the same time and under the same conditions. Now theoretically that should mean that they would share only common causes. So whatever was happening in the process at a time uh, would be shared by all three samples or all five samples, however many you took. And here we see the 90 data points or 30 in 30 groups uh, plotted uh, in an X bar, uh, the averages, and also as a, as a range. The data above on the X bar seems to be moving normally about the, uh, the center line, the green line there, uh, nothing unusual going on. And that would be expected because it was uh, generated from normally distributed data. A newer type of control chart is the X bar and S chart. Not terribly new, but it's newer for considering the use uh, over the many years. This type of control chart uses a standard deviation just to show the dispersion. Well, the, uh, although the X-bar and S-chart is more accurate per se, and with computers on every desk and powerful statistical software readily available, the X-bar and R-chart is still very commonly used due to its simplicity, its continued usefulness, and the difficulty of changing anything anywhere. Um, switching to this uh, to from, a, from an R-chart R to a, a, an S-chart may require updates to policies, a, a SOPs, many, many documents may need to be changed. 
So here we see an, an X bar S chart, and uh, the data uh, above show the upper and lower control limits to be identical to the uh, to the uh, uh, the upper and low, lower control limits uh, for the X bar and R chart. However, uh, the standard deviation uh, of uh, upper control limit and lower control limit are tighter now. Upper control limit is 1.101, whereas two something before. Now, a control chart is nice to look at, but it must tell us something about our process. In particular, it must tell us if our process is behaving as we expect it to or desire it to. In the early years, it was really up to each individual practitioner to decide for himself or herself whether the data in the control chart showed common causes or special causes. Now, common causes are inherent sources of variation that are usual, random, and always present, basically the noise in the system, the static in the line. Special causes are external sources of variation that are unusual, unnatural, and not always present. They are what we call the signal in the system. Distinguishing between common causes and special causes can be difficult in the beginning, and in 1956, the Western Electric Company codified a system of four rules for interpreting control charts that became known as the Western Electric Rules. In 1984, Lloyd S. Nelson published an article in the Journal of Quality Technology describing eight rules which for interpreting control charts that became known as the Nelson Rules. There are variants of these rules, and, are, and as many as 10 to 11 may exist in different industries. In this course, we'll cover the rules as used in many tabs uh, analysis, which follow the Nelson rules. Rule number one, one point is more than three standard deviations from the mean. As we see, two points have exceeded the upper and lower control limits here. Now, two samples have out, out, uh, wandered outside the normal distribution where really about 100% of the data should be. The upper and lower control limits bound to 99.73% of the, of the data. Why are these points outside that? It does not make sense. Rule number two, nine or more points in a row are on the same side of the mean. There should be data points on the other side of the mean. They should be randomly distributed on either side. 50, 50, it should be about a 50-50 split. 50% uh, should be on one side, 50% on the other side. So a prolonged shift from the process uh, mean uh, has occurred here, meaning there's been a, sh a shift in the data. Rule, six, rule three, six or more points in a row are continually increasing or decreasing. There's a directional trend becoming apparent at this point. Something is drifting. Rule four, 14 or more points in a row alternate in direction, increasing then decreasing. In this case, the process seems to be oscillating. This is not simply noise. Now, the position of the mean and the size of the standard deviation do not affect this rule. Uh, this could be caused by a number of things. Uh, this can be co caused by uh, uh, controls, uh, uh, turning on and turning off, making uh, readings high and then low. It could also be co caused by uh, using different operators at different times where one has a bias in one direction, the other has a bias in the other direction. It will take some investigating to figure out what is causing this. Rule five, two or three out of two, three points in a row are more than two standard deviations from the mean in the same direction. And this is a, a moderate tendency for samples to be moderately out of control. At two standard deviations is 95% of the data. And at one standard deviation, uh, it should be 70% of the data. So once you're outside of two standard deviations, you've exceeded where 95% of the data should be. Yes, yes, data should fall out there periodically, but not two or more in a row. Rule six, four or five out of five points in a row are more than one standard deviation from the mean in the same direction. Now this is a stronger tendency for samples to be moderately out of control, and the logic is the same. 70% of the data should be, plus, be between plus or minus one standard deviation, and we have so many data points out there in the 95% range, that doesn't make sense either. Rule seven, 15 points in a row that are all within one standard deviation of the mean on either side of the mean. Some variation beyond one standard deviation would be expected. We were complaining about too much before, now we're complaining about not enough. Uh, this may be indicate that maybe a sensor or something is stuck or something is, is, is frozen uh, where the measurement is not getting t taken uh, and, and you're not really seeing the, the, the variation here. But there should, be, there should be more data outside of one standard deviation. Something may have happened to the process, tightening it up. That may be something you're expecting. After, after an adjustment. 
And rule eight, eight points in a row exist with none within one standard deviation of the mean, and the points are in both the directions from the mean. Data points jumping above to below the first standard deviation band is rarely random. Something's going on, and this could again be, uh, as mentioned before, uh, going from shift to shift uh, or from operator to operator with differences in procedures and or going from different pieces of equipment uh, may show this type of behavior. Now Minitab can contract the control chart data against the Nelson rules. Note that Minitab allows the user to select the criteria for each test. So as you see here, we, we've selected perform all tests for special causes, and the factors that we want to use, uh, you know, not left, for instance, second one down, K points in a row on the same side of the center line is set at nine. That can be set down lower to seven or eight uh, at your discretion. So it depends on how quickly you want to know that there's a potential signal coming from the system. And here we see an exponent R chart of, uh, of a variety of, re of readings. We see a red square and, and a number, one, on, the, uh, uh, on this point. We see a five over here, and we see six uh, on these points here. Minitab can track control chart data against these Nelson rules. Besides the, re uh, the report, the, the graphs that are generated, uh, the Minitab will also generate uh, uh, descriptive data in the session window. So here are the test results for XBAR uh, chart readings. So test one, one point more than three standard deviations from center line. Test failed at point seven, sixteen, and uh, forty-seven. So it'll give you what the failure was, what the test was, and where it happened. Same thing for test five, two or three points more than two standard deviations from the center line. Where did it fail? Sixteen, forty-five, and forty-seven. Test six, four out of five points more than one standard deviation from the center line uh, on one side of the control limit. Test failed at nineteen, thirty, thirty-three, and forty-seven. And these are the results for the uh, for the R chart. So we had some failures of one point more than three standard deviations. And it also gives you the warning that if the graph is updated uh, with new data or the new data is, is up there, the results may no longer be correct. Now, when all special causes have been identified and eliminated and the process is under control, then the process can be centered on target and the process can be tightened and improved. Now remember process rule number one, no process without measurement, but we're measuring. Remember process rule number two, no measurement without analysis. We've just done the analysis. And process rule number three, no analysis without corrective action. However, there can be hazards in taking corrective action. Watch out. Now this is a famous device called the quincunx, invented by Sir Francis Galton. It was just a, consisting of a vertically held board with rows of pins interleaved as shown at the right. Uh, balls are dropped from the top and they bounce either left or right, 50-50 chance as they proceed through the pins. The balls are collected in the bins at the bottom. The number and position of the balls always takes on a normal distribution as you see here. The balls are bouncing as they go through the quincunx and then they pile up in the different bins down there and you always get a normal distribution. Now, you should visit this website and observe the spread of the balls as they fall. That's a good point to, to stop the video and go back, uh, uh, go to the website that's listed here and uh, uh, try out the little application that's there. After you watch the performance, then try to control the balls by moving the slide bar in the upper left and try to keep the balls falling directly in the middle. Whenever a ball falls to the left, try to adjust so that it falls on center, which means move the slide to the left also. Whenever a ball falls to the right, Try to adjust so it falls uh, on center. Adjust left move to the, to the adjust, adjust the left move the slider to the right. To adjust right move the slider to the left. Observe what happens to the spread of the balls. Now, if you've done the uh, the, the experiment with the quincunx online, you will notice that changing a process at all will make the variation in the process much worse. Basic rule of statistical process control is this. Variation from common causes should be left to chance, just left alone, don't touch it. Never tweak a process that is under control. But special causes of variation should be identified and eliminated. Other types of control charts. I, the INMR, individuals moving range charts. 
They're an additional type of chart that's used when there's only one result and there are no subgroups to obtain an average from. An example for this might be taking the pH of a batch uh, of a liquid product where there's only one result obtained as the pH could, should be consistent from point to point. So we're just monitoring batch data here. Note that the range starts being charted on the second data point because it's the difference between the moving range. So as each point is, is added, uh, the, the calculation from the first point to the second point becomes the, becomes the range. Second to the third is now the range. P-charts are used with attribute data and are typically used for tracking proportions or percentages. The control limits in the pie chart, the P-chart, are based on the binomial distribution. Here we are looking at the number of rejected bottles reserved, received per week. The, the number of bottles received each week varies. So one week you may get 10,295 bottles, and the next week you'll get 11,250 bottles, uh, whatever it may happen to be. So you know that the control limits vary from week to week with the subgroup size. And p-charts are also used with attribute data and are also used for tracking proportions or percentages. However, they require the subgroup size to be constant. <clears throat> Here we're looking at the number of bottles projected per million bottles received. So note the control limits do not vary from point to point as the subgroup size is fixed at 1 million. U-charts are used with attribute, attribute data also and are typically used for tracking count data. Here we are again looking at the number of rejected bottles received per week. The number of bottles received each week varies as, as it was before. Notice that there is little difference between this U-chart and the P-chart example previously. C-charts are also used with attribute data and are typically used for tracking proportions or percentages. However, they also require the subgroup size to be constant. Again, here we're looking at the number of bottles rejected per million bottles received. So what's the difference between a p-chart and a u-chart and an np-chart and a c-chart? Well, the p-chart, proportion chart, and the np-chart assume that the results were either pass or fail, which is why the binomial distribution is used. For instance, it's the number of, or the percentage of patents, patients who report a side effect. Patients either report something or don't. So it's a pass-fail type of situation. The u-chart and c-chart assume that an unlimited number of bad things or good things could happen. So the number of side effects per day reported by patients who report, a patient can report more than one side effect. So one patient could have three side effects, one could have one, one could have ten. Now Minitab provides a decision tree for SPC charts to help you select. So if you have continuous data and you have not collected them in subgroups, the I and MR chart would be your choice. If you did collect them in subgroups and the subgroups was uh, eight or less, you would use an X bar and R chart. It's much more convenient. And if it's larger than eight, you would use the X bar and S chart. If you're collecting attribute data and you're looking at defects per unit, use the U chart. If you're looking at defective items, use the P chart. Now key performance indicators, trees. KPIs are quantifiable measurements that will reflect the critical success factors the organization has decided upon. A KPI tree shows the relationship and structure of the KPIs to their areas. Each area will have its own KPIs and KPI tree, and there may be several of these uh, depending on uh, you know, what's going on in your, uh, in your operation. So let's say in manufacturing we are, are, we're using computer services, and we've decided that the important things to us are availability, reliability, capability, and life cycle causes costs. <clears throat> availability, we want the computer systems uh, that we're using to be available 100% of the time. We don't want them to be down. Uh, reliability, we want them to perform the way we want them to perform. They should get the correct answers or, or to do whatever function they are uh, uh, correctly every time uh, we want them to do it. If it needs to print something, it should always print. Uh, we shouldn't have to have problems every other day. Capability, it should be able to do all the things that we want them to do. So. If it needs to print, it sh that should be part of the capability. And life cycle costs, of course, the uh, overall costs over the life cycle of, uh, of using these computer systems are an important uh, indicator. Standardized processes is a term for ensuring that solutions become fixed in the company's operating procedures. Your solution must become the new way of doing business in order to last. Use the existing company systems for implementing your solution. Use company SOPs, standard drawings, 
use existing visual aids. Anything that's already existing, bring to your, into your hands. And do not create something unusual, out of the ordinary, or hard to understand. Make sure the other systems your solution will, will need to fit into actually do work. They may need some, they need some, may need some fixing also. And document, document, document everything about your solution. Without clear, easy to follow documentation on what the solution is and how it works, the solution will be quickly lost to memory and the organization will revert back to its earlier practices and all the gains will be lost. This is also a good, good, good idea, a good time to implement or revisit a 5S and it should be looked at quite frequently throughout the course of the project. So we want to sort things, straighten them out, shine them up, standardize the, the, the procedures, and then sustain them. And vis finally, visual management is a tool for keeping the solution continuously present in the, in the uh, organization's mind. And it's typically some, some type of a chart or a readout or a printout, an LCD screen, etc., whatever the case may be, that is frequently updated with the key performance indicators so all workers can monitor how they're doing. This can be a TV screen uh, when in the locker room, such things like that. And here's an example of a visual management tool. The card on the right is clearly labeled areas for clean filler parts to be hung in, 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 in a place and a place for every part. Uh, all parts can be quickly found and changed over without wasting any time searching through drawers or bins to find the right part, which would slow the entire changeover process down. So this whole thing may be monitored with, a, with the chart looking at changeover times, and that may be displayed on a wall where, uh, in, in, like it's in a locker room, uh, where all the uh, operators can see it and all management can see it to see how things are going in the plant.